بزنیم ول کنیم Okay, I'll just wait. Amon, I think we can admit everyone now. Okay, uh, Liz, can you please disable the waiting room? So I guess we're good to go. I would like to kindly uh, ask everyone to turn off your videos, uh, but thank you everyone and welcome to this recorded webinar on mobilizing your knowledge, turning insight into impact. Merci à tous et à toutes et bienvenue à ce webinar enregistré sur la mobilisation de vos connaissances, comment transformer le savoir en impact. My name is Iman Kozam. I am the Bilingual Knowledge Mobilization Specialist here at Research Impact Canada. And today we are bringing the slide deck to you in collaboration with our partners, Future Skill Center and Magnet Platform. If you want to learn more about who we are and what the work that we are doing about within the community of practice, we are going to drop in the chat box the link to the community of practice by FSC so that you'd know more about the activities that we are doing in the workforce and skills development sector. And we also encourage you to join our mailing list, also dropping the link uh, in the chat box. So you'd be the first to learn more about the activities and training and initiatives that we are doing. There's so much that might be actually helpful for whatever projects you are currently uh, intending to implement or doing. So if you listen to me for the next 45 minutes, I promise you that you are going to leave this webinar feeling much more prepared and confident about how to target your audience and stakeholders and how to reach out to them in a way that can help direct them to taking actions towards your desired outcomes. And so uh, this is going to be an interactive webinar. So as much as we want to uh, share with you the tools and resources that we have combined and reviewed, we also want to hear your impact and your, uh, your input and your feedback. And this webinar is going to be the first out of a series that we call the Professional Development Toolbox Series. And what we're trying to do is that we're trying to host once per month a webinar covering a different topic that is uh, covering resources and tools that are relevant for anything that is related to the skills and workforce development sector. So moving on, as I said, this is going to be an interactive webinar and we are going to use Slido. I would like to encourage you to join me right now and use this uh, computer, your phone, and try to direct the camera to the uh, QR code that you see at the screen. And just let's start our engagement. Uh, if you feel free, you know, tell us who you are, introduce yourself, tell, tell us your name, what your role is, and where are you joining us from today? So all that you have to do is to take your phone and direct the camera towards the screen. Okay, we see here three participants typing and Toronto, Ontario, amazing. Tell us more about the role that you're doing. Where are you joining us from today? what organization you're currently working on, working at post-secondary institution Toronto. We have more Toronto peeps, that's amazing. <laughs> Sylvie Plante, welcome Sylvie. In Ottawa, I hope the weather is treating you well today. We've, I've been in Ottawa like a couple of days ago and it's been quite cold. 
Marco Campana, freelance consultant in the immigrant and refugee serving sector. Excellent. Stakeholder engagement, Thunder Bay. Amazing. Pam, so good to see you again. In an internationally trained pediatric dentist, I'm graduate students of McGill. Welcome. Strategic initiatives and future of work, literacy, joining MSC. That's amazing. Carrefour Communautaire Francophone de, Lo de London. Bonjour et bienvenue. Support. Support deaf individuals with employment goals. Excellent. Workforce development manager for supply chain. That is amazing. We see a lot of diversity in today's participants. I will just count to five just for the sake of time. And before I move on to the next slide. So just to give some, some time for our three other participants who are typing. So in five, four, three, to one, that is amazing. I'm so happy to see so many people joining us from different sectors. And I really hope that this will add to the richness of the session today. Now, before we start our webinar, there are two couple of things that I would like to cover. The first one is covering some housekeeping items. So when it comes to today's session, we are offering simultaneous interpretation. And thanks to our interpreter, uh, Caroline Chandonnier, who is going to provide the interpretation in French. So if you prefer to tune to our session in French, you can press on the globe icon at the bottom of the screen and just listen to Caroline doing the interpretation. We have also enabled closed captioning. So you can see the English subtitles at the bottom of your screen, and you can do that by pressing on the live transcript button. And this is going to be also uh, a recorded webinar, and we are going to post it on Rick's website within three weeks period. And if you have any questions, please feel free to write them on the chat. And if we have time towards the end of the webinar, we'll be more than happy to address them. And so now the second important part is the land acknowledgement. So we, as we can see, and we have seen today, not all of you are joining us from the same territory. So we encourage you to share your land acknowledgement from the territory you are at. In the chat box, as for us here at Research Impact Canada that is led by York University, we acknowledge and recognize our presence in the area that is known as Toronto, that is currently being taken care by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the huron Vendat, and the Métis. We also acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wanton Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. So, Moving on, let's start hearing from you. What brought you here today? What is it that you think that knowledge mobilization or learning about it can help better achieve your goals? And it can be anything. Just write us a word or two. It can be to uh, raise some funding. It can be to increase more awareness about a specific topic you're advocating. It can be, yeah, we're seeing people here sharing. Increase awareness, show impact. Amazing. Related to my thesis, replication of good ideas. Increase knowledge of our services. Amazing. Best practices. What I, I can see increasing knowledge of our services, a common development, impact, learn, transform, research practices, addresses, show impact. I can see the word impact. That is great. Increasing awareness. Someone mentioned Canada, which is great. Understand. That is excellent. Uh, whatever we're going to share today, I would like to invite you to try to look at those tools and try to reflect how you can use them and implement them in the context of your own personal projects and your own works, be it a thesis, be it a project that you're planning to implement. That is great to hear today. And so now moving on, 
uh, as for us here for the session today, what we are going to do aligns pretty much into the majority of those goals that you've mentioned. First of all, the title is about knowledge mobilization. So you're going to see, the word seems a little bit jargony, but you are going to see that it revolves around so many practices that you are already implementing. What we are going to do today is we're going to take that term and deconstruct it so you can go about it in a more strategic way. And we are going to provide examples examples in the workforce development sector so that you can learn more how to take that term and implement it for your own personal project. And the, the second thing, an element in our presentation today is to provide you with those tools that will help you better mobilize your knowledge and share the information that you want to share with your own targeted stakeholders. But to do this, we have sent you a couple of hours ago a folder, including several resources that we will be covering today. Those resources vary between best practices, between self-paced course, between practical guides. And what we're going to do is going to go about each tool on its own, provide you with an overview of it and an example on how to best implement it within your own personal work. Now let's start with two stories. The first one is about a problem that the city of Edmonton was facing. In fact, one out of three applicants for the jobs they were posting were unqualified. And because most of the job descriptions were dictated by the union, they almost 90% of those job descriptions, they didn't really have a lot of freedom to explain more about the job vacancies that they were posting. So realizing that 50% of the job applicants were actually mobile users, what they did is that they decided to integrate in their job description a podcast that is no longer than five minutes long. And in that podcast, the hiring manager will be talking more about the, the post that is the role that is being posted, what is the job about, what is the vision regarding to the successful candidate, what is the vision of the organization itself. And now what happened is that those videos, and you see an example here at the bottom left of the screen, those uh, audios were actually downloaded between 150 and 1,000 times. And although the total amount and number of job applicants has dropped, the number of qualified applicants actually increased and it was widely positively received by everyone, both employers and job seekers. Not only that, there were so many people who otherwise wouldn't have applied necessarily to the position just because they felt that it's distant from them. But after hearing the podcast, they felt much more encouraged to apply. The second story is about a research that has been done by the social work department at York University. And it was targeting the influence of TikTok in mobilizing knowledge and creating more awareness about gender affirming medicine. What they have realized is that trans and non-binary communities did not really have a lot of access to information about things related to healthcare. And they usually used to resort to peer-to-peer -peer conversation or personal surfing on the website just to get access to information. And so what they did in this research is that they actually uh, created 13 videos covering different topics related to hormone surgeries, to gender affirming medicine, and they, those videos, each one of them was not longer than 52 seconds. And they posted those videos within a one month period in 2021. And what they have found is that those videos were cumulatively viewed 300,000 times and they were shared over 100,000 times. So there was a lot of mobilization happening through that time and people were actually not only liking it, they were sharing it again, they were promoting those topics among each other. So now I wanna hear from you, looking at those two stories and the approaches that were used and implemented in those two, two different contexts, do you see anything that is in common between them? And if, if those characteristics, what would they be in your opinion? And I would love to hear from you now. Reach. Good. Target, using tools target audience are using. Reach, we hear it again. 
social, use, media, broader, excellent. Reduce barriers for reading. Oh, I love this. Multimedia, innovative tools for dissemination. Beautiful. Using tools target audience are using. Again, efficiency, meeting the community where they are at. That is amazing. Short and factual info. Reach, reach. I can see that word being magnified over and over again. Community, intentionality, community engagement. That is amazing. Okay, I am going to move on. That is amazing. You have covered most of the characteristics. So, and it actually what, what these two approaches have in common pretty much align with what all of you have said. In fact, there is something that is very important, and that is that those two approaches are knowledge-centric in the sense that realize they realize that knowledge is a resource itself, but learning how to access it, how to use it, and how to manage it is very important to making informed decision. And so their focus was about conveying information and making sure that the knowledge is being properly accessible. The second one, and it pretty much echoes what a lot of you have said is the reach, is that it's user-centric. It's meeting people where they are. They know that their audience, they hang out on TikTok, so they reached out to them in, on TikTok. They see them, that they are mobile users. They go to them to, to their mobiles through podcasts. And the third one is that they are responsive in the sense that they are con conversational. They use tools that are prompting dialogue, conversation, they adjust to the progression of social media as a tool to, to have a conversation and they leverage that tool so that they can convey their, their information and hear back from their, their audience. So you might say to me like, Iman, this is great. These stories are, stories are amazing, but so what? Why is it that we're talking today about knowledge mobilization? And why have we chosen this topic to share with you specifically in the workforce development? Well, there is a research and a report that has been released in 2021 by the Future Skill Center and the Labor Market Information Council. And that report was targeting why adults in Canada are not making use of career services that are readily available and for free. And what they have realized, in fact, is that 19% of adult Canadians are actually using those services in comparison to 38% in other OECD countries. So that is almost half of the percentage in other countries. And what were the reasons for that? Lack of awareness and access are the top barriers. In fact, one out of five respondents in the report did mention they did, didn't know that those services existed at all. And almost 21% said they did, it was, you know, the reasons and the barriers were related to time and cost. Not only that, the report also revealed that gender and access to education determined the level of engagement with those career services in the sense that men and um, people who had access to post-secondary degree were most likely to register for this, those services, leaving women and people without access to proper education, who, those people who are in most need to benefit from those care services were not actually aware from them. And so how do we bridge that gap? We bridge that gap by making sure that this information is accessible to the people. We bridge it, we go a step forward to those people and we coach them on how to learn about those services, how to look for them, how to access them, how to register for them. That process in itself is a form of knowledge mobilization, is an example of knowledge mobilization. And this is what brings us here today with you. Now, what is knowledge mobilization? In its traditional way, knowledge mobilization is usually coined with research. So it's everything related to the dissemination and creation of research-related activities. But knowledge mobilization is much more than this. It's a means rather than an end itself. It's about sharing information that is accessible, that is useful, and that can actually be used. The second part is that knowledge mobilization is about understanding the world of the potential users. 
Who are our users? Who are our stakeholders? What are their needs? What are their interests? Where do they hang out? Uh, hang out, and where do they reach for those information? And that in itself will guarantee that there will be a higher level of engagement and application of whatever knowledge that is being shared. And the third characteristics is about building relationship. Knowledge sharing is a collaborative work. It's not one directional process. It's about building partnership with our stakeholders, engaging in a dialogue with them, hearing from them what their needs are and creating that space to co-create the knowledge sharing experience. And so if I were to focus or reflect on it in a different diagram, I would say that partnership and dialogue are key and think about the two stories and two approaches that I have talked about before and what are possible aspects of knowledge products. It can be anything you can think about. It can be a social media campaign. It can be a report. It can be a call for proposal. It can be uh, a brief, a uh, policy brief. It can be a meeting or a we webinar or a workshop. Everything you can think about that revolves around conveying specific information is a form of knowledge product that can benefit from actually um, a, a strategic way of knowledge mobilization. So whatever you are in your institution today, you can be or your role that you are currently undertaking, you can be more inclined toward implementing projects with the community. So you can be a career service organization, or you can be focusing more on research and a part of a university or an institution and seeking things that are related to the labor market or whatever research happening in the workforce development, or you can be somewhere in between, like a think tank, bridging between research and also projects. Whatever you are at, knowledge mobilization can be valuable to the work that you are doing. And so knowledge mobilization is not an activity that we do in one day and then we go. Knowledge mobilization for it to be completed in an effective way, we have to think about it in a process. And this is what you see here on the screen. It's just an example of how the process might look like, but in its all entirety for it to reach an, an impact and to be effective, stakeholder engagement should be very essential and always incorporated in each of the stages of knowledge mobilization. And that includes the creation, the dissemination of knowledge, its uptake and its implementation. And we'll go about each stage in details. So for the creation part, what does it mean? It means the time where you decide that you have a specific message that you want to convey to your audience or stakeholders or knowledge users. So what this message could be? It could be a new practice. It could be a research finding. It could be a report on a project that you have completed and you find that the results are worthy of sharing. And it can be an, a, a cause that you want to advocate about. Suppose, for instance, we have our protagonist here, Sarah, who is a capacity building professional. And Sarah has noticed recently that a lot of people have been sharing both excitement and concern about the use of AI platforms such as ChatGPT or Tom or WordTune in the work and in integration at work. And a lot of people with administrative positions are fearing that their jobs might actually be at risk. So what did Sarah do? Sarah contacted, reached out to her network. She started talking to people who are taking in administrative roles. And she started talking to nonprofit organizations working in upskilling their community. And she started asking them, would they be interested about this topic? And in what format they would love to have their capacity being built on so that they can learn how to best use those tools. So after doing a lot of research and conversations with her network, she decided that she wanted to focus on the use of, on, on building the capacity of people on how to better use those AI platforms and integrate them in their roles. And she decided that she's going to do this through a practical guide. That is the level, an example at the level of creation, and we will follow the story of Sarah as we are going to continue with the stages. Moving on to the dissemination, that is the part where we have known, identified what is the research topic that we want to share, and now we want to transfer it to people, and that is what dissemination is about. 
How do we disseminate information through what medium? It can be anything you can think about, can be social media campaign, videos, infographics, policy briefs, toolkits and guides. In the context of Sarah, what did she do? She started a social media campaign and she started sharing her practical guides, adding some infographics, promoting it online on LinkedIn. And she started to look at the comments, what people are, um, are sharing about that practical guide that she has provided and posted and what are their concerns, what are additional adjustments that they would like to have or more information. And she took those comments and, and reactions and she started to refine further the guide that she was working on and reaching more even through her network. The part of the uptake, it's great. We have shared our information. We know people have received that information, but we want to make sure that after receiving their information, they are implementing it in their appropriate context. They're not taking it as it is and just you know, doing it derived from their own surroundings, they are taking and properly understanding the knowledge that we have shared. And this is the part where we step closer to our stakeholders. How do we do this? By engaging with them visually or in person through focus groups, webinars, meetings, a briefing workshops, roadshows. These are elements where we step closer. In the case of Sarah, again, what she did is that after setting this guide, she started to conduct several meetings with diverse groups. Some of them are um, people who are taking on administrative roles and wish to have further coaching. And other groups were um, uh, people from career services organizations, frontliners who wanted to learn more about how to deliver that practical guide to uh, their target uh, audience or targeted stakeholders. And she did further elaboration on the guide and guided them on how to implement each for their own specific context. And now finally, people have learned and got the sufficient training on how to use all of those resources for their own projects. And now this is the part where there's implementation. We want to ensure that the knowledge is being properly incorporated and adopted by the stakeholders in the policies and practices and services. So it can reach not only the audience that we are targeting initially, but also the broader audience. And in the case of Sarah, again, her first stakeholders, the people she talked to and she engaged with in several meetings, they have taken those, uh, they have taken this guide and started to integrate it either through trainings for other job seekers or people who wish to be upskilled or through personal coaching, or they have started to integrate them in their own personal tasks. So as you can see here, this is the, these are the different stages of knowledge mobilization process. And, you know, we don't have to go from one stage to another right away. Like we can go back again from dissemination, go back and revise a little bit within creation, go back to the uptake, apply again, and then refine again the tool. As you can see in the case of Sarah, she was going back and forth uh, on her practical guide, and she was always, always tuning in, finding ways to engage her stakeholders and her knowledge users. And so now again, we want to hear from you within your own organization. I want you to share with me if you want to reflect on your own personal organizations or your role, where do you see so far uh, that you are putting a lot of engagement with your stakeholders in which phases of your project? Uh, and if you can run, rank it from the, from the stage where you are least engaged with your, uh, with your audience to the, to, the, to the one that you are most engaged. Great. So we see a lot of people here are focusing on dissemination. They engage with their audience through dissemination. Excellent. So dissemination comes up first. Still, creation comes in second. So people interact more while they're disseminating their information, also while creating their knowledge product, amazing. At the implementation and the uptake, there's the least level of engagement. As we can see here, the, pretty much the, even though the bars are changing, but we still see the same level of ranking. I'm going to wait for the two remaining participants and we'll move on in five. Three, 
Oh, <laughs> now it has changed. We see creation and dissemination coming at the same level. Excellent. Okay, so we see in all in all, the bulk of the focus and, and engagement of the stakeholders, it's happening at the level of dissemination and creation. The least amount of engagement is happening at the implementation of uptake. That is great to hear. So now where do you think that knowledge mobilization is most applicable at your work now that you have seen this example and those different stages? So the first question was kind of a reflection about your own personal uh, practices. And this one is about looking at those practices and seeing how do you think you can fit them best in your work? I'm waiting for people to join in. We have two participants typing. Uptake, okay. Dissemination, but I see uptake still taking a lot of dissemination. Okay, great. Dissemination again. Okay, I can see, I can see dissemination taking the most part. Okay, great. I am going to move. Someone is saying dissemination, sharing best practices between different cultures. Excellent, excellent feedback. Okay, moving on now to the tools. So I'm so happy to hear that a lot of you find a lot of importance in sharing knowledge in the dissemination and uptake part, because a lot of the tools that we will be sharing actually revolved around those two stages. So what we will be present presenting at the second part of this webinar is the tools that you can use today to help better advance your work. And these are going to be a total of seven tools that vary between practice, best practices, resources, and self-paced courses. So without further ado, let's start with the first tool. What is the best practice is by crafting compelling messages. The first format that we usually engage with people is through writing. But it's not just enough to write an extensive description about a specific activity that you are passionate about. For something to actually make an impact and resonate with other people, it has to have three characteristics. The first one is to make sure that your audience is able to understand. So writing precisely and briefly, as, as briefly as possible. The second one is making sure that the audience is moved throughout the message that you are sharing. And the third one is that you're clearly stating what action do you want from your stakeholders or audience or knowledge users? What is it that, they, that you want them to do after hearing that information? Do you want them to, um, to advocate for your case? Do you want them to pay some, some funding, you know, participate in funding your projects? Do you want them to uh, actually access your service? or encouraged to be to join them. You have to specify your action as clearly as possible. And we are going to drop here, as you can see, I'm, I'm talking, my colleague Liz is dropping on the chat several links related to examples on how you can move and, uh, and um, you know, encourage people to take action. Now, on how to write clear and simple messages, we have provided to you this wonderful guide on how to write in a clear way. This guide is part of a course that has been developed by the Mobilize You course by York University in collaboration with the Peel Halton Dufferin Adult Learning Network. And there are, it's a PowerPoint presentation, and it includes uh, within it an access to a video where it describes a step-by-step -step on how to write in a clear way, in a simple way. And as common sense, you know, it seems it's actually a process that it needs work and it needs a specific level of strategy. One, two takeaways I got from that specific PowerPoint is that term TLDR that is actually commonly used in research, and it means too long, don't read. So people actually don't have the time to read. And as much as we can think strategically about how to write an easy and short message, this is where we can guarantee that at least we will secure much more attraction, much more engagement. 
And the second part that the PowerPoint covers is really going into details on how you go about writing a message that is clear and brief. And it takes you through a process of, it's, it's, it goes along a six step process from the moment where you want to think about the message to the moment when you want to revise it. So that is your first tool for you to refer to. The second part is that we know that not a lot of people are engaged necessarily through reading. Some people are engaged more visually. And for that, we have provided to you this um, beautiful course. It's a one hour long interactive course on how to design infographics specifically for knowledge mobilization. This is a beautiful course that includes different types and introductions about uh, the different types of infographics, how to think in a way that is visually engaging. And you have ample of opportunities to kind of answer specific questions and they provide you with a lot of tips. And you also have the opportunity to test your knowledge through completing some short quizzes here and there. I'm guiding you just quickly through the course, just so you can see how it looks like. This is a course that is being provided and available at Rick's website. We're also dropping the link to it online. And we also provided to you a transcript of that course that looks more like a practical guide in your toolbox that we have sent within an email a couple of hours earlier. And there are so many available um, websites today that you can use. You have Canva, you have Visme, you have so many available websites where you can use today uh, your information and project it in a more visually engaging way uh, without really spending a lot of time in it. But how to think about how to design an infographic so you can deliver your message in an effective way that in itself can be best learned uh, and used through the tips that are provided in that course. So this is the resource number two. Now, what if your audience were policymakers? For policymakers, you want to go to them in a way that they are used to and structure that they know. And that is through policy briefs. Let's say you have a research and you have a set of recommendations that you feel pro providing them will help advance a lot of things related to society. And you want to show this in a very clear way. And so we have provided to you here, also through a PowerPoint presentation, this wonderful guide by International Development Research Center. And it provides ample of tips on how to go about the each components of writing policy briefs. It targets your structure, it targets your audience, it targets the purpose of your policy briefs and what type of recommendations you want to give and also how to revise policy, uh, how to provide uh, revise your policy brief. But I would like to remind you something that it's not only enough to share a policy brief and post it on your website or send it through an email to your policymakers. You really have to take that policy brief, go in person and reach out to your own targeted stakeholders and talk to them. So there's always that level of personal engagement that is key in terms of taking that information and absorbing it correctly. And this is that what we have talked about in the uptake phase. So this is your third tool to refer to. Now, also some people, do you remember when we said that people need to be moved as well? There's nothing better than art-based approaches to engage the public. Now, when we talk about art-based approaches, what is it that we specifically mean? It can be through visual arts, so it can be through photography, video, digital media, drawings, etc. It can be through performing arts, such as theater and dancing. It can be through games, through video games, uh, virtual realities, street-based games, and it can be through immersive art installations, such as pop art installations in exhibitions or in conferences. And finally, it can be through comic stories, uh, through storybooks, through poetry. So you have a lot of different categories about, of, of uh, art-based approaches. But how to use them in a way that can advocate your social case or how to create an artistic initiative that in itself uh, can be best discussed through this beautiful workbook that is called Framing Community. It is also included in your toolkit and it is done by Ontario Arts Council. 
This workbook is fantastic because it trains you on how to go about the process of creating an artistic approach. It also provides you with how to with information, how to seek funding, how to seek references, and how to seek resources. And it gives you an ample, ample of examples about successful uh, career projects. So excuse me, because I'm spinning here very quickly, but I just wanted to show you here. There are several initiatives that have been done to advance very um, diverse specific causes, and it guides you step by step through that process. So I would highly encourage you to just spend some time, go through this workbook and see if you want to reach to the communities and to the examples that have been shared in the workbook. And for me, in addition to this, there are two examples that I really love. One of them is this museum. Also, we're going to drop the link to the webpage for that museum on the chat. This is the work, uh, the Workers Art and Heritage Center. And it is, it is a community museum. So what they do is that they host a lot of, it's based in Hamilton. And what they do, they do a lot of activities and events related to different cases, to the history of labor, to the rights of laborers. And um, it, it's just very diverse. So if you go about the website and see what activities they have, can really give you a lot of ideas. And they also have this like permanent collection of artifacts. And this is what you see in the picture here is an examples of banners that represent collective strength, and they were used in uh, unions and in uh, trades and in parades and protests to further uh, reflect pride and collective strength, strength of workers. Another example is the movie Rama. I don't know if you've heard about it, but Rama has received so many, um, you know, Oscars and it, it got a lot of engagement. Well, it actually does. The movie depicts the story of a domestic worker who was living in a family in Mexico in 1970s. The creators of that movie, after creating it, they met and collaborated with a lot of nonprofit organizations and the International Labor Organization, and they did several screenings followed with discussions with the um, uh, with the Congress in the US and in Mexico, and it actually led to the change uh, uh, in the legislation in Mexico that allowed 2.4 million domestic workers to have access to contracts that guaranteed better benefits and even paid annual leaves. Now, we have created our uh, our content, we're so happy with it, but before sharing it with our community and our stakeholders, it might be very helpful to just take another look at it and make sure that we have done some kind of self-assessment and self-reflection prior to, our, to sharing it with the wider audience. How do we do this? This wonderful checklist that has been provided by Cochrane Institute, that it's, um, it's an international network for systematic reviews. They have provided this checklist that is a series of questions that you can refer to. And after you look at your text or your infographic or your policy brief, you get to take that checklist along and see, have you addressed all of those questions answered within this checklist? And then kind of it will allow you to do some relative self-evaluation before going about disseminating your knowledge. And to make sure that you are answering those questions correctly, we have also provided to you a guidance that is also done by uh, Cochrane that expl explains elaborately each of those questions and what is the purpose behind them. Now, you might not find all of the questions necessarily uh, relevant to your work, but just going about that checklist in itself is a good practice to start with. And maybe later on, you want to do some personal adjustments to cater it more to your own projects. Not only that, but we also have this beautiful guide by Cochrane as well, uh, that provides to you an examples on how to create effective images. So it's not only, you know, we said that people are engaged visually, however, not all images work. So sometimes an image might actually help advance your case, and other times there are some images that might work otherwise. So, you know, I'm a, one of the people who learn best through examples that work, but also examples that don't work, because sometimes I get to see my own personal work and compare it and do the adjustments accordingly. And so this guide 
is also great because it provides you with a lot of guided uh, reflections and tips on how to select the images that can better captivate your audience. So this is also a tool that is readily available for you in the toolkit. And it also there is a part uh, either in this part or in the guidance checklist that tells you, gives you as well examples of good successful text messages or content to be published and bad examples of examples that could need further improvement. Now we have covered five, we still have two more tools to go. It's great, we finalized the dissemination, we've revised our document, we've shared it with our people, and now we want to see whether they, whether they have understood it or not, and we want to make sure that the knowledge is being properly uh, integrated and contextualized. And this is the part of the uptake this is where we facilitate this process by stepping, uh, by getting one step closer to our audience. How do we do this? Through our briefing meetings, through our roadshows, workshops, focus groups, conference exhibiting, whether in person or virtually. And when we talk here about conference exhibiting, we're not talking about standing behind a podium and doing a presentation or a state, you know, over a stage separate from the people. We're talking about creating a stand in a conference so that people can come to you and can engage in a conversation because we want to create that safe space for people to have the freedom to elaborately talk and express their ideas, make sure that we are allocating the time for them. And I would like to encourage you through that process to be mindful about each different meeting. So one meeting, you can be doing an introduction about a specific new practice about um, a community that is focusing in the healthcare, and you want to tailor it to the needs of that specific community in comparison to the similar training being provided to folks in the um, career development uh, sector or folks in the uh, tech industry. So you want to make sure that all of those are catered to the needs of the society. And this is where we go back again to that knowledge of understanding the world of your knowledge user. Now, to make sure that our meetings and events are as accessible and inclusive as possible, we have also provided to you this wonderful uh, course that is also available at RIC website. And it gives you a guide, by, a step-by-step -step guide on how to prepare for an event and how to host an event and how to reflect on an event that is uh, inclusive, taking into consideration the diversity, the equity and the inclusion element into all of its aspects. So this is also an interactive course. Uh, we have also downloaded and delivered the transcript of that course to you. So you can access to it on your own free time, but we also would like to uh, encourage you to do it online because it's very interactive and you get an ample of opportunities to also test your knowledge. Now we have gone about everything. We have disseminated our information. We have talked with people. We have made sure that they have implemented this and incorporated it in an effective way. But as, as I mentioned before, knowledge mobilization is a process. And the fact that it's a process, it dictates that we have to go about it in a strategic way. It's not an activity that we do it one day and then we just go. So to think about knowledge mobilization in a strategic way, we have provided to you this dissemination guide of guides that has been developed by our uh, di uh, network director, David Phipps in collaboration with Annalise Potts and Stacey Ross. And this dissemination guide of guides is also a PowerPoint that you can see. And it's a list of tables. Those tables identify each specific categories. Each category has several questions that helps you focus your attention so that you would be a better able to identify who your stakeholders are, what the goals that you want to achieve, and what are the barriers that you want to face. And you might want to take the time to go about this course by, um, excuse me. I just need a second. Yes, you might want to go about this course uh, individually or collectively. Um, okay, 
So if you want to go about it individually, you have that time, or if you want to collaborate together with your team and gather together so that you can think together about how to go with your knowledge mobilization strategy, this is your time to do so. So what do these elements cover? They cover the goals, but not the goals of your project, rather the goals of your knowledge sharing. So you might not stay in the organization or your stakeholders might change or the project might last longer. So what is the ultimate purpose that you want to achieve for sharing that knowledge specifically? We're talking beyond your project. We're talking about the process of sharing conversations and engaging with your audience. So you have things on the short term, which could be like for a year and on longer term, five years or longer. It also covers, as I mentioned, stakeholders, activities, who can facilitate that knowledge engagement, what are the potential barriers that you might face, and how you will be evaluating it. So this is the final tool that I have shared before. Now, there are a lot of things that I would like to just give, you know, kind of remind about this entire webinar. And that is, as I mentioned before, knowledge mobilization is a process. It's covers creation, dissemination, uptake, and implementation. It's not a one-day activity that we do and we leave. Stakeholder engagement is key to each of the stages so that we can make sure that we are achieving the desired impact that we want and that the impact is relevant to the stakeholders' needs. And finally, for knowledge mobilization to be effective, knowledge sharing should be done in a way that is accessible, that is useful. We're focusing on the understanding of the context and the world of the potential user, and we're centering about building around building partnership and engaging in dialogue. And so this is a kind of graph that summarizes all the tools that I have shared here before. And these are the seven tools. As you can see, the dissemination guides of guides is worth to spend a lot of time on it by taking the time to build a strategy. You have here a lot of tools revolving around dissemination. I'm so happy that so many of you did mention that they want to integrate knowledge mobilization in the dissemination stage. And we have here the tool of uptake. And if you find any alternative ways of using the same tools to elaborate more on your knowledge sharing activities, please feel free to share with us. What I want you to do for now is I want you to take the time to look at all of those tools that are reflected in this graph and just look at them. We have destination guides of guides, clear writing, infographic, community engaged artwork book, writing policies, revising your knowledge through knowledge dissemination guide and making meetings accessible and inclusive. And now I want to hear from you. Which tools are you most excited to use after this webinar? Where do you think that these tools that we have provided can be most helpful and beneficial to the work that you're doing? Accessible and inclusive events planning. Great. Dissemination guides of guides, excellent. Excellent. Guide to clear writing. Okay, I can see a lot of changing. So for the part now, what we see is we see a guide to clear writing, knowledge dissemination essential guide, accessible and inclusive events. Excellent. Great. I'm so happy to hear this. Now, what is the most valuable takeaway from today's webinar? What is it that we have shared that might have struck a chord or you feel that you want to take away with your roles after you finish this webinar? Would love to hear from you. How important engagement is along the whole process of creation. The amount of resources available to help. Excellent. Again, stakeholder is, engagement is key, key to making sure that all your projects are actually relevant to the needs of your audience. Meeting communities where they are is key. Thank you so much for mentioning this. This is excellent. The resources you've provided and the big picture overview provided along with specific practical examples. I'm so happy and I would like to encourage you to really spend some time in looking at those resources on your own time. It's not enough to just provide you with an overview. You have to 
spend a little bit of time just going back through them individually. And uh, so you can actually put them in practice. Involving the persons who will uptake the work in early planning stages. Excellent, excellent. Incorporating knowledge mobilization in the dissemination process. That is amazing. Thank you so much for your input. This has been like a joint learning experience. And what I would like to encourage you that if you wish to receive further support from us as you go about implementing those tools, please feel free to reach out to us through uh, this following email address, info at Research Impact Canada. That will be very uh, like beneficial for us to do and to reflect, and we'll be more than happy to provide you with that additional support. And I would like to also uh, invite you and ask you if you can answer now, like a small poll, it's around three questions about uh, just the accessibility of, the, of this webinar itself, if you find it useful or not. Um, you know, how did you learn about it? Whether it was it accessible, um, et cetera. And in the meantime, I will be looking at the chat to see if we have any questions here. We have 36% who has participated so far in responding to the poll. Like providing your feedback will be very, very much needed for us to make sure that our work and our trainings are catered to your needs and are actually beneficial and helpful. So thank you so much for spending that time to giving us your ideas and your input. This is going to help us as much as we hope really to help you in advancing your projects. Okay, that is great. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I will, um, I'm looking right now at, at the chat. Um, we have Sarah who's saying, excellent resources are all these links in the email and resources as well. Yes, the links to the stories, we, what we have shared here in the chat are just links to the stories that I have talked about. But uh, in the resource toolkit, you have access to all the seven resources that I have uh, covered today. So feel free to use them and access them. And if you happen to register just recently within less than a one, um, uh, one hour and you wanted to have access to that toolkit, please send us an email at info at researchimpactcanada.ca and we'll be more than happy to share with you that tool again. Thank you so much for your input. You have been an amazing, amazing participant. And we look forward to hearing from you in our other future webinars. Uh, we wish you a really wonderful, wonderful rest of the week and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.